Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Zev Ash, and it's my pleasure to welcome Hoi Bam to the podcast. Hoi is in Japan. It is 9 p.m. Hoi, I believe. It, please introduce yourself for about a minute. Who are you? Yeah, so uh, great to be here. Thanks uh, for uh, for inviting me. Um, I would say, I mean, in a minute, it's a bit uh, difficult, but I'll, I'll try my best. So basically, uh, been in Asia for 16 years. That's pretty much the year uh, when my life changed. Um, I guess, you know, there's this really interesting quote. I don't remember by whom saying, you know, everybody has two lives and the second one begins when you realize there's only one. And I guess that's kind of uh, when I realized that um, my life had to change. So until the age of about 26, I was born and raised in Portugal. I know the, the uh, you know, university thing, got a good job. Um, was doing pretty well, but I felt like life had to be more than, you know, just those uh, uh, basic uh, uh, stereotypical things that most people follow. And, and that's when I decided to uh, basically embrace the unknown, come to Asia. And I've been here for 16 years. So um, half my professional career working for big companies, half of it startup stuff. And for the past two, three years, focusing mostly on uh, consulting and mentoring like like yourself okay perfect so you teased that up beautifully and so i'm gonna go back a little bit and and start there where i always start that if i ran into you in in were you were you in lisbon in portugal yeah. is that where you grew yeah. up yeah yeah so if you if i ran into you in lisbon when you were 14 15 and i said hoi what would you like to be when you grow up do you know do you know what do you remember if, if there was an answer back then uh, at 14, 15, uh, I would probably say a football player. Uh, it's, and it's I guess so soccer for yeah, Americans. Exactly, exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Soccer yeah. for Americans. So um, I, I, I started playing soccer very early uh, on with my with my father. We actually had like, uh, you know, these evening sessions in the kitchen with a tennis ball. And I remember playing with my with my dad pretty much every night. And so I, I, I was very, very uh, uh, into um, soccer. And yeah, playing at school, playing at home. So I felt, you know, maybe I have a shot at this. But honestly, I never really took it seriously. And I guess as it happens with most uh, people, uh, uh, you know, were born uh, uh, and raised back in the 80s and 90s, the, 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 the parents' dreams a lot of the time, uh, uh, I guess, overpower your own personal dreams. And so I basically went, you know, the normal route, as mentioned, you know, high mm -hmm. school, college, get a good job. And that's pretty much what happened. But probably football player. So you at 2003 um, yeah. apply okay. to a job with Unilever, which is a huge consumer packaged goods company, multinational. Yeah. Correct. A thousand people apply for a job. Uh, only five people get accepted for, I guess, what we would call here the internship in the US. Uh, yeah, train, traineeship, traineeship. I yeah, guess that's right. what they call. So, yeah, a, a exactly. traineeship. Uh, and within three months, you get offered a full time job to work for them. Um, so, you, when you applied for Unilever, uh, what what did you think you were going to do? What I mean, at that point, you had you said like college, and then big dreams, dreams of working for maybe big companies. What did you? What were you after? So I, I did uh, business management in college and I've always, or I, I, I thought at least at that um, point in time that um, my um, vocation was finance. I've, I've always been pretty good with numbers and those are probably the best uh, marks I got in college. And the worst was actually marketing. So when I got the job at Unilever, when the HR asked me, okay, what do you want to do? I want to do finance. They said, no, you're completely wrong. You're going to basically do a three month, which is basically the three first months of the traineeship where you're basically going to be doing sales. And uh, in three months, I fell in love with sales and marketing. And, um, you know, for uh, what, eight, nine years that I worked, 10 years that I worked for Unilever, I never did uh, anything related to finance. I only did marketing and sales and, and I loved it. So it was a bit of a 180 degree when compared to what I initially had anticipated. Uh, and and the reason why I find this to be very interesting is because, you know, we have this tendency to think that, okay, we studied this or we were in university, we're really good at this, really bad at that. And that most likely means that you should be pursuing a career in what you're good at and what you're not good at. 
But the truth is, as I think Mark Twain famously said, um, you know, I, I never let uh, um, school interfere with my education. So uh, as, as as much as I went through school, and of course, I was much better in finance than I was in marketing, I ended up pursuing marketing and sales, and I never looked back. So um, that was an interesting twist there. What What was the product line that you were selling slash marketing at Unilever? So I started with um, the first, um, so after these three months in sales, I think the first six months, I actually, I was very lucky because the, um, my boss at the time, she was pregnant. She was running or managing the, um, uh, a brand that was basically selling uh, machine wash detergent. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not a very big business, but the sizable business and she was pregnant so she basically left on maternity leave and me the trainee basically took over so i had from very early on i had a lot of exposure to uh to you know the brand management role that normally you'd only get after a couple of years i i had that experience like three or three to six months into the job and that was really interesting and that basically propelled me to the to the following job which was i was then offered uh, assistant brand manager at the biggest brand unilever brand in portugal and then very quickly, uh, I basically transitioned to a brand management role as well in, I think, a year and a half. And so this first experience was was really important to get me the exposure that I needed to uh, to basically climb the, uh, I guess, the corporate ladder mm -hmm. as quickly as, as as I could. So it's 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 interesting because my approach generally when when I'm up against people with, I call it the golden resume, who have the blue chip companies that they work for. In your case, it's like Unilever. It could be, mm. I mean, in marketing, it's, oh, I worked for Google, I worked, et cetera. Um, there's a part of me, because I spent my entire career in the small business world by design, because I wanted to do it. Um, I interned with IBM in graduate school, and I knew I would never be, never be able to work for a big company. It's just mm -hmm. not the way I'm wired, but it, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's interesting because my approach was, you know, we learn the, the learning when you are in the small business world is drastically different than working for large companies because we don't have multi-million dollar budgets. <clears throat> we don't have the type of resources that are available to these big companies. So yes, you learn, you learn how to do things, but it's within a certain level of comfort. Correct. Uh, when you go Absolutely. to and and I know you work with startups and founders, so you can relate to it. When we go to the bootstrapping or even small companies that their marketing budget might be twenty thousand dollars a year, it's not millions. And so you still have to squeeze every dollar and try to get the most out of it. And very often we're up against the bigger companies, right? So you yeah. might say, "Well, you're set to fail if you're up against." A giant corporation that has million dollars in their marketing budget and you're trying to, it's the david and goliath kind of thing right um but you it seems like you got lucky and spent you know a lot of time with a with i mean a really really good company yes. and and in, consume, and, and in a consumer package world i think that's a really really good training because they get to the real nitty-gritty of marketing of especially in detergent like it for for laundry um, yes absolutely and and i would i would uh, and i i really like the way you summarize it there and and again i i don't uh, i don't want this to sound as advice to anybody because i think giving people advice is always a dangerous thing but uh my my now that i look back i feel like that those first few years at unilever gave me two or three really interesting competencies that are hard to or maybe take longer to get if you don't go through the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky, as you mentioned, I mean, the company is, is, is incredible. A lot of the business stuff that I still use today, I learned it uh, um, you know, uh, while I was working there. I was also very lucky that uh, I would say 80% of my bosses were incredible people, as in people as and, and bosses. I learned a lot from them. They, 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 they pushed me, uh, uh, they stretched me, they pushed me really hard to, 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 you know, to, to deliver and to accomplish. And, and I feel that caliber of people, unless you work for very established startups like the Googles, the Apples, you know, the, the Facebooks and all, all, all these guys, it's probably difficult for you to have access to this caliber of people very early on in your career. So that was a really, really good thing that I got. And the second thing, which again, you can see 
from both a negative or a positive angle, which is a negative is kind of, I think what you mentioned, which is, yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically um, doing business in a way or running business, but there is, there's so many layers of hierarchy that all of that is done in a certain level of comfort, which is true. But that's also, I think, a positive thing, which is I could run a business without having to use my own money, right? And yeah. I could I could take decisions, but because the decisions always be approved by you know, my boss or my boss's boss, that also gave me access to um, kind of a... a um, different ways of thinking about the same problems I was I was I was feeling and so that gave me again if you can learn from the more senior mature people because they're telling listen instead of going left you should go right because of a b and c and if you're kind of a logical rational uh, person you will learn a lot from that so those two things I think were very very important and as mentioned I now in the in the work that I do I always get the feeling and I don't know if we're going to get into the startup thing but I always get the feeling that one of the most fundamental things or one of the most fundamental thing that most founders suffer from is this feeling or this sense of overwhelm, right? We can be doing so many things left, right. And then I have a meeting with a customer who asked me for feature B and I'm going to go back to the office and, and brief my devs to start working on it. But then investor wants feature C. And unless you have a very uh, uh, high level uh, uh, or skill in achieving a certain level of clarity and focus, Mm -hmm. running a startup becomes very difficult. And those are the skills that I learned at Unilever and that now hopefully I can share with the, you know, with the people I work with. So, and, and we'll definitely get into the startup because that's, I think one of the, one of the main reasons I wanted to, to have you as a guest, but um, one of the interesting observation uh, I seem to come across very often is that um and again, I'm not generalizing, but generally speaking, if you are working for a large company, um, most people take the safe lane where they conform with what the expectations are. They're not risk takers within the corporation because the, the exposure, if you make a mistake in a large company, it, it vibrates through different layers. And it's like, well, who made that mistake, right? Uh, and right. so people tend to be no more to be conformist in, in a large companies where in small business, at least from my experience, we're able to take more risks because there's they're not there's no bureaucracy between me and the owner of the company, right? There was maybe initially when I started, maybe one or two layers. And then for the most of my career, I was the guy next to the, the founder, the owner. And... When we when we took risk, it was it was a joint decision to take a risk, but we did take them. Um, but again, it doesn't doesn't mean that that working for large companies is not beneficial. I think you you're just proof you acquired some really really important skills that that you can sort of scale down if there is such a thing into into the startup world and the founders. So so let, let's let's jump into the when you're 26. And you're going through, a, you know, a midlife crisis at 26, <laughs> and you decide, you know, I'm working, for, I'm, I'm living the dream, right? I'm working for a great company, doing well. My parents are proud of me, but I'm not happy, right? So then, how did you go from there to Asia? As in, I, I know you speak, you speak Chinese, and you're fluent in Chinese, and you're fluent in Japanese. What Flu no no fluent fluent is a is a is a word you can ever employ when uh, speaking about uh, Asian languages. So yeah. okay. my Chinese is decent, uh, my Japanese is basic. Okay, so uh, so, so, so I, I could have I could have this conversation in Chinese, but not in Japanese. Let me put it that way. Oh wow! But you, and you live in Japan now, which is interesting. yes. So exactly. so what happened in twenty six? What something you you have this revelation that and I'm guess everything's working great, but you're not happy. Um, my, my, um, I've always wanted to have an experience abroad, working abroad. And, and even if, you know, in 2003, I, uh, sorry, 2006, I had only been working at Unilever for three years. I, I was very vocal about my, um, plans on, you know, getting some sort of, um, 
um, assignment abroad or something like that. And I always felt like the company was not, um, they were not dismissive of that, but they were kind of, yeah, I mean, but you're still young, we have time and all that stuff. And I felt like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I just felt like I needed to, uh, I needed to, to do that as quickly as possible. And so what happened was, um, and this is actually a pretty um, interesting story, interesting as in, and you'll, you'll understand why in a second. Uh, there, there is one person who basically changed my life forever without knowing that they were doing that. So what, what, what happens is, so again, I'm 26. I met Unilever. Everything is going well. Uh, my mom uh, is, especially my mom, is super proud of me because again, you know, you, you know, you know, you like the, this high flyer in a big company, and you know, maybe one day you're going to become the CEO, or whatever the, her uh, 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 feeling about the situation was. But again, I, I as mentioned, I wanted more. I wanted to experience. Uh, um, life abroad I know if that's the uh, the Portuguese discoveries DNA from the 1600s or the 1500s but uh, you know I wanted to see more and so I um, I knew there was uh, uh, this um, um, you know the Portuguese government I think they still do it and this is start, this started probably in the early 2000s they they every year they would pick about 100 uh, Portuguese uh, uh, professionals and then and then they would basically send you to you know, uh, I, I think the list of the of countries probably more than a hundred. They would basically pick people and then assign people to different jobs or different internships in different countries for about nine months. It was a really well paid internship back then. The, the the Portuguese government was sponsoring that, and I applied. I got in. The interesting thing is, as I got in, actually before I knew I got in, they asked you to quit your job. So now I'm basically caught in between, uh, you know, kind of a, 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 um, a stone and a hard place, right? Which is, listen, you have a great job, you're making good money, you're young, you have a lot of potential here. And by the way, you got accept, kind of accepted into the program, but they haven't given you the final confirmation. You need to quit your job at Unilever because if you don't, you cannot take the internship. And so I, I quit. I said, listen, I'm going to go all in, you know. Let's see what happens. What happens, happens. And I quit. And I eventually got the internship and they sent me to China. And they sent me to China for nine months. Um, and I don't know exactly you decide I was going to go to China. And that's the person who changed my life forever. Uh, and who, again, I don't know who that person is, but I'm I'm forever grateful for, for, for that decision. And so I, I went to China. This was January 2007. And I was supposed to go for um, nine months. I ended up staying for uh, eight years. And that's how my life changed. But did you speak Chinese at that time, or you learned no, on the job? Nothing. I, I had the one. I had the one month uh, um, intensive course in Lisbon before I before I left. But I mean, I don't know if you've been to this side of the world. But one thing you quickly realize when you land in uh, a place where um, you know they don't use the alphabet; they use the characters. Is that mm -hmm. you know? It, it, and it's actually pretty interesting, insightful experience because you are twenty seven. And for the first time or the second time, but you don't remember the first time, is you're a baby again. You cannot communicate. You cannot talk to people. You cannot understand what's written. And so it's there is this sense of uh, being powerless, right? Because you need to get stuff done, but there's just no way of, of getting your message across. And so um, it took me a while to get uh, to a decent level. Uh, but uh, what happened next, which is also the interesting part of the story. So again, I'm assigned to this nine-month internship uh, working for a big uh, telecommunications company, uh, Alcatel, which had just merged with the American company Lucent. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm assigned to this uh, nine-month internship. And the, in the internship was really bad because the companies had just merged. There was kind of a power vacuum. Uh, uh, nobody was doing anything. Everybody was kind of waiting for the next steps. And so I'm basically caught in a situation that for me, as someone who had this ambition of uh, develop professionally i was basically caught in this you know nine month thing that didn't make a lot of sense what happened that is super interesting is uh one friday night i'm invited to a party at a friend's house and um don't ask me how and why there is a brazilian guy there who's working for unilever in china I say oh you work for unilever actually my boss is the vp is a brazilian guy he wants to build a team of foreigners here why don't you send me my resume and i'll make sure it you know it lands on his desk and so i did this was friday saturday morning the guy has, has my CV on his on his inbox, and I, I got a call on Monday from this Brazilian VP, basically inviting me for lunch on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I had a job offer on the table, so I ended up leaving the internship. Unilever actually paid the Portuguese government so that I could leave the internship before the uh, before the uh, the nine months, 
and uh yeah and that's 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 uh how the story in china begins well it's called um poetic justice right you go to unilever when you work in portugal and you say i'm a young guy i want to go overseas and they say no nah, no nah, you just sit in your cubicle and when, when we're ready for you we'll tell you exactly. you quit you go to china and then you wind exactly. up with unilever in china so that's that's a beautiful story by the way what what the portuguese government have done is actually available in the u.s uh it's it's called the fulbright scholarship uh after a senator many years ago named fulbright who created this program where uh young people mostly young people are either in school but mostly out of school uh are able to go overseas to any country of their choice mm -hmm. on a special project and you actually act you actually have to apply to it with the type of project or research that you want to do and it's pretty intense and then you go for a year and they the Fulbright scholarship pays for you to they pay your rent they pay your living expenses and my son was a Fulbright scholar he's a jazz musician wind up in Korea and they also pay for you to to study Korean so it's part of part of the package um and it's pretty interesting so very similar um, so that so that's so that's how you get to China that, and, and that's how I get you. And, and, and the kicker is, which is the interesting thing is, so again, I'm in Portugal. I want to get an assignment abroad. The answer is sure. I mean, we believe you have potential, but you got to wait. I quit before I get the, the internship. I get the internship. I move to China. The internship doesn't work. I get hired again by Unilever and I get, I double my salary. Okay. And I get promoted before actually having to do the time to get the promotion, right? Mm -hmm. Which was great. And again, and, and the final kicker is I end up leaving Unilever again in China two years later, and they hire me back a third time uh, uh, a few years later uh, for you know double the salary again. So it was, I, I, I always say, proudly say that I'm probably the person uh, within Unilever who got uh, fired or, or quit and, and got hired uh, uh, the, 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 the most times. Well, lucky that somebody recognized that that you have talent and value, and 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 made the move that they needed you. So, but, but the interesting thing for me is that you go to China and you have, you took a a, a one month maybe immersion thing, but you yeah. still don't yeah. speak the language. No. Um, and, and those are cultures. Uh, I, I think we, you and I shared before we we got to talking that I mean I am, I absolutely love Asian culture. I particularly love. Uh, Japan and I got a chance to travel to Japan and Korea when I was in the business world uh, and for me to go to Japan first time was like a kid in a, in a candy store I was just I was absolutely in awe even though I studied Japanese culture in college um, so but again uh, I remember I was in Korea and this the, the first night I got really hungry at two o'clock it was nine why didn't talk like it was 11 o'clock and I said, okay, I'm just going to go outside the hotel and go get something to eat. And I walked into the streets. There was nothing in English. And there were these street vendors with food. Um, it, it, was a, it, it, was, it was really a shock, like you said. You know, you look around and it's characters. And, and I, I wind up finding a tiny little place, like a, almost like a, in America, I'm sure you have them there, like 7-Eleven. And I bought a, yep. a candy bar because I didn't know what they were cooking on the streets. And I, I'm... I'm very adventurous and i love sushi and i'll eat anything but i still was um, there was no one with me so i the question is how do you work in china without speaking chinese i know people that you work with can speak to you in english but you're still in china right yes it, it's so so and 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 i think i think the diff i think there are differences between when it and definitely certainly today i mean it was not the case maybe you know 16 years ago and i moved to china but uh if if you basically have china korea and japan uh they're at, all at different uh, um sides of the spectrum so you have japan from the three countries the country where you have the least uh, uh fluency in, in in foreign languages right so if if you remember in japan you know uh, you have very few people who speak english mm -hmm. korea i would say is probably in the middle and then china that's definitely the case today, and they've done incredible progress in that front, is you can get by uh, without speaking uh, uh, Chinese. 
I was, again, because I was working for a huge multinational company, everybody, I mean, speaking English was kind of a prerequisite for you to be hired by, by Unilever. And so my boss, my assistants, my peers, they all spoke English. So that was, uh, uh, um, you know, easy and, and easy for most foreigners. Now, what I did at some point was when I quit Unilever then in China in 2009, I actually took a, a year off. I went to India for a couple of months. And then when I came back to, to, I was in Shanghai. When I came back to Shanghai, I actually enrolled in a full-time uh, um, intensive Chinese course at the university. And that's basically when I was able to take my Chinese to a basic level. Uh, in the same year, I met uh, actually a Japanese, Chinese, half Japanese, half Chinese girl with whom I lived together for four years and she didn't speak any English. So we made Chinese the, uh, the I guess the couple couple's language and so in you know I remember the first dates I was basically carrying you know those electronic dictionaries with me mm. trying to uh, make sense of what she was saying but then very quickly I would say probably after six months I was emailing messaging speaking in in Mandarin and and of course over the course of those four years that's how I was able to take my Chinese to a pretty decent level. So I, I wanted to jump quickly before we get into startups and, and the meat of, of what I want to talk to you about. Uh, well, maybe you opened the door for me because you had a Japanese girlfriend. Is How did you wind up in Japan? Um, it was another love story. Um, I basically, so I moved to China in 2007. This was January. And uh, there's three main um, holiday periods in China. There is the kind of February, uh, which is the uh, what they call the Chinese New Year. It's around February. It's like lunar year, but around, you know, uh, beginning mid-Feb most of the times. Then you have April, which is you no know, labor, labor day, labor week. And then you have October, which is the kind of the national, uh, the big national holiday. So in October, normally they give you about uh, a week and a half of holidays. And I came to Japan with a couple of friends who were also doing this internship in China. And I don't know if it happened to you, uh, uh, if you had the same feeling, but I landed at Narita Airport here in Tokyo. And in five minutes, I just knew I had to live in Japan. Don't ask me why, and I'm not one of those, uh, I guess, um, um, spiritual metaphysical people who feel like the energy is different than anything like that. But I just felt there was something that I could not explain that I was drawn to. Uh, and from that moment, from that trip, this was 2007 until 2019 when I moved here. So for 12 years, I was trying to find, you know, any way possible to move to Japan. Uh, because again, I just felt like, you know, I had to do it. So here I am. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, when you land in Narita, the, the well, it's generally speaking, the, the efficiency yes. uh, of Incredible. the Japanese system uh, is, is really amazing. I mean, the... The, the shocker was you get on this bus and then it's an hour and a half to Tokyo after you fly forever to get to there, which was which was really the thing. But everything was just the, the whole idea of service with white gloves and pointing. And it just it just it really is incredible. But we could talk about Japanese the, culture. The word, and... the word I use used incredible. I, I the, the word that I found so far that I think better describes Japan is magical. There is something magical about the way things are done here, and that's really what what I think um, attracted me so much to uh, to live here. And you know, every single day, even now after four years, I go on the street and there's something new, something magical happening every day. And I mean, I'm I'm always you know impressed by by how this country operates. It's just it's just magical. Yeah, and and I got to do business with them, which is absolutely fascinating. And for, I mean, Western world. Is different, but especially in the American business culture, when you go to Japan and you sit down with with people who are your partners, and you find out that competitors openly talk about their finances and and they share what they price their products. It and and Americans look at each other and said, "What? Why would you tell those secrets?" It's it's it, it's it's really a completely different universe and approach to life in general, but also in business, which is incredibly fascinating so let's jump into you're in japan at some point you leave the corporate world and you become an entrepreneur as in what you do today right um and in in your linkedin you write i'm extremely passionate about entrepreneurship 
teaching and mental models. And the piece that interests me is the mental model thing. What do you mean by that? Uh, I guess, I mean, mental models is, 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 is probably just um, a word that um, generates some sort of uh, suspense, I guess. But, but the idea here is, uh, and, and this comes also from, from, from some of the insights that I got as I you know, started I mean, building my own companies and, and, and working with other businesses is, and goes back to this sense of overwhelm that I mentioned uh, um, a few minutes ago, which is the idea that um, in order for you or in order for an early stage startup to do the job that needs to get done, in a more efficient way. I do believe that the way to remove a lot of that sense of overwhelm is to provide step-by-step -step instructions on how certain things should be done, right? Let me give an example. And one of the sessions that I, probably the session that I do the most is the, and you've probably seen on, on LinkedIn, some of my posts about cold emailing, right? I mean, emailing is one of those things that everybody does, but very few people know how to do really well. And so the moment, because again, if you if you think about cold emailing and you don't give people a structure or a framework on how to do it properly, you can go in a million different directions. But the moment you actually ex explain people that, listen, there's four things you need to look at. You need to look at the subject line. You need to look at the fact that most emails are written on a laptop, but are read on a mobile device and that changes everything. And here's how you should approach the first, the second and third paragraph, right? The moment I give you a mental model or a framework, or let's call it a methodology, you remove a lot of the overwhelm because now people understand what's the best step-by-step -step approach to get to where they need to be, right? And that's yeah. kind of my idea behind the mental models. Got it. So there's a guy in uh, in the US, I don't know if he made it to Japan. Uh, his name is Greg Lamanis, and he had a, a show in the US called The, the Profit. Uh, so Shark Tank is the big deal, but The Profit mm -hmm. was usually followed after um <clears throat> and i mean sometimes i say i do what he does except he writes the check to take mm -hmm. over the business like he takes equity and he says okay from this point on i'm making all the decision he doesn't take majority ownership but he takes he, he deals with struggling businesses and but his model is the you know the people product the process right that's to him it's the three p's and he follows that as mm -hmm. as a uh, as a template to which is true how do you assess and that's how you grow a business so when you say mental models you're talking about the process and yeah uh correct and i i don't i don't i don't, and, and sometimes people ask me is that the template and for me a framework no, no. and a template are two different things yeah. so i don't like to see that as a template i want to i prefer to see that as a framework right there's kind of a, a certain yeah. steps that correct so so let's call it the mental process yeah, yeah. Uh, that I, you and, to and you're right. To... I, I use a word that I actually dislike a lot. I don't like the word template because it it implies that's how you do it. We've done it before, and if you just copy it, things going to happen. Correct. I didn't mean. Correct. I, I meant his his framework, which is thank you for correcting it because is is people product process, which are the three ingredients to driving any business successfully. And um, the guy's super super successful and. Clearly, for us, for you and me, who we do similar things, uh, yeah, that's the key to success. So, you decided to be a. So, what do you call yourself today? If I said, to, if I met you, if we sat next to each other on a plane, and I said, "Hoi, what do you do for a living?" What would you tell me? Yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably say I'm, I mentor startups uh, or early stage startups. If you want to be a bit more um, specific. Um, and of course, I mean, mentoring, I guess, you know, um, different mentors have different styles. Um, but I would probably say, I don't like the word coach. Uh, so I'll probably say, you know, a startup mentor. The interesting thing about this is, and, and as we're discussing uh, uh, offline before we started recording, um, I've not met anyone who does startup or early stage startup mentoring as their full-time job. I know a lot of people who might do it kind of as a side gig, but I have not actually met anyone who does it for a living. And so um, it was a couple of years ago, I said, okay, am I going to do a bit of consulting on the side and mentoring 
I said, no, I mean, what I really enjoy is, you know, talking to people, going through these mental models, helping them solve the problems. And so I felt, okay, let me go all in and let me do this for a living. And so I would say it's probably a good description of mm -hmm. what I do. And I think that <clears throat> at least for me, I mean, I've been a business coach for 11 years. I'm, <clears throat> I'm with you. I think coaching as a concept is, is a brilliant concept when I first ran into it uh, 11, 12 years ago. But it's become a commodity, and there's a lot of um, bad coaches out there that just mm -hmm. completely dilute the process. And then people say, oh, coach, yeah, I did it before. It doesn't work. The mentoring sounds more of a uh, – it, it gets a different flair to it. Um, but to me, mentoring was always – you know, I'm, I'm mentoring my ex-graduate school students to this day. You know, I have a group of people that I stuck with. And I mentored them on career changes and marketing, and some some of them started businesses. Uh, but there's a different flair to it. But you make a living mentoring, right? You actually get paid yep. to mentor people. Yes, um, correct, <clears throat> correct. Uh, and I think the reason most people, I, I don't like the word most, I'm not going to use it. I hate words that sound big, but they're, they don't have any uh, objective proof in, in data. So I'm not going to say most. But there's some people who don't do not work with startups because they typically don't have money. They're bootstrapped, mm -hmm. and they're always there's so many things they're trying to do. And he said, "Okay, you, I can work with you, but it's going to cost X." They don't understand the value of actually working with somebody who's a mentor. So the interesting piece for me is because I'm on on growth mentor platform that you and I know and. And we mentor for free. People always ask, "What's the difference between mentoring and coaching, or what's mentoring anyway?" And the, the definition that I like the most is a mentor is somewhere is someone who is where you want to be one day, and they can guide you how to get there. Right? It's almost like a, a a Sherpa thing, which is which which is a really good way to present it. Um, but you focus on startups, so you deal mm -hmm. with the people that have those some crazy ideas <clears throat> and some not so crazy. Um, how do you separate what you do from what your clients do? And and let me explain. Uh, when when I work with my clients, I always tell them my job is not to judge whether your product or service is a great idea or not. It's not for me to judge. My job is to take you where it the probability of success increases because we're doing things correctly but i'm not going to tell you whether whatever it is whether i like it or not it's not relevant whether i like it or not how do you separate how you feel about the products but and 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 i'm asking because it's critical with startups right somebody is putting their entire future into this mm. sometimes mm. yeah um excellent question and and i would say my job starts before what you just described. And I think it's not necessarily um, because that's the market need or the pain point, but it's by design. What do I mean by this? And, and that kind of ties back to, you know, I guess every mentor has their own style and their own way of approaching it. I've, only, I've always disliked, and again, it's just a personal dislike. It's nothing, uh, um, you know, uh, nothing against anybody. It's just my personal dislike is whenever I go into a session and the person asks me, okay, so how can I help you, Zev, right? I always get a bad feeling about it. And so what I did was instead of me coming to the session and asking you what your problem is, I take the very cocky approach of assuming you don't know what is what is the problem. And so my first session, couple of sessions, which is always kind of a non-negotiable in the way I conduct my sessions is I guide them through my KPI framework, my KPI mental model. And we try in a couple of sessions to basically understand what the business priorities are. Because sometimes maybe if you have a product is revenue, but maybe if you just have an idea, actually the KPI is, is the launch, right? So depends on which stage you are. What never changes is this very early stage need to have the level of clarity on what needs to get done. Because once I understand what is it that you need to do, then I need to, I, I can allocate 
my expertise and the time that we spend together in tackling the right problems. If I assume that you already know what the problem is, I'm going to be working on whatever legacy issues you have, which might, by, by the way, not be the correct ones. And so I prefer to give a couple of steps, steps back and assume that you don't know what the problems are. And again, it's more of a personal uh, approach. Um, and I think that's maybe why um, startups see the value quite quickly is because unless again, you are, of one, you are one of these very experienced entrepreneurs that has done it a bunch of times. And in that case, maybe you don't need my help. People don't have a lot of experience. They immediately enjoy or very quickly enjoy the benefits of for the first time not feeling overwhelmed with what needs to get done and be very clear about, you know, here's the two, three things that we need to work as a team over the next six to 12 months, right? So again, it's more mm -hmm. of my personal approach, but I feel it's been working quite well. Yeah, and, and it's super critical uh, to have that approach and to actually find the right client, which is the skill set that we develop as coaches or mentor is, is how do you find the right client? Meaning someone who has at least the the humility to recognize that you know what maybe i don't know what the problem is maybe i do need an outside objective uh opinion for someone that sees things uh someone sees the clarity quicker quicker than the person immersed in trying to to Correct. start and grow a business Correct. but this Correct. is the most critical point in their journey because the one thing that they don't those that don't listen to you learn the hard way you can't afford to lose time right so if you decide that you know everything and you're going to push through and hope that things work out and then you wake up a year later 12 months and then you you maybe you raise some money uh that time frame you lost is never coming back and then you're Correct. scrambling to fix what's wrong to begin with which is where you wanted to come in to start with Let's identify. You don't know what the problem. You, well, you think you know what the problem is, but you really don't know. Most likely, and and the other thing that is very interesting is what you said. Is first, the person needs to be willing to be coached or mentored, right? So there is this kind of uh, um, ego exclusion, or you need to exclude mm -hmm. the ego from the equation. Which again, as you know, from for founders, it's a difficult thing to do. And then on top of that, they're going to pay you for that. Mm -hmm. So yep. you need you need right. So you need you need to uh, uh, conquer these two uh, um, kind of bottlenecks, which is number one: Am I willing to be coached by someone? And by the way, am I willing to pay what this person uh, 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 is charging me to get mentored on whatever problems I might have? Right. So as you yes. said, it's a difficult thing to to become a full time job, but uh, you know, uh, as 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 uh, as one of my favorite quotes, you know, the the harder the battle, the sweeter the victory. So uh, yeah, we keep pushing. Yeah, and look, I'm very generous with my time and my, you know, we call it the assessment period where I meet with somebody and we talk for an hour plus about their business where I try to, and there's a strategy behind there. I try to get to know them to see if this is somebody that I would enjoy working with through an interaction and through a conversation and some good questions, you could begin to see what some of the issues might be. But I always end it with... Uh, look, where we go from here is up to you. If we decide to work, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But here's here's my advice. If you want to pay me to tell me what you want me to do, then don't waste your money and my time, right? But if you want to hire me for the things that you don't know and you recognize that you don't know them, then then, we'll, then this is going to work really well, right? Um so it's sort of like I I help their ego because some of them, uh, no, no, I know exactly what I need, but I just don't have time to do it, right? And I said, okay, then then you don't need me if you know exactly what you need. Then go hire somebody to do that. Exactly. Uh, pretty interesting. So um, you say the best way to achieve anything in life is to develop the, nece the necessary discipline to carry out a good habit in a consistent, regular manner. Doing 10 push-ups a day does more for your fitness level than 100, 100 push-ups in a while. Where did you learn that wisdom? Um, well, I, I mean, that, that's been my experience, right? And, and when people ask me, you know, what, what do you feel is your, I guess, the HR 
uh, uh, jargon uh, for this is zone of genius, right? Which is oh, what, yeah. what's what's right? What is the thing that you have that you feel most people around you don't have? And I've always felt like I have uh, maybe an uncommon uh, um, ability to uh, endure, right? And to go through uh, difficult uh, or 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 consistently or 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 many days in a row feeling discouraged or feeling in pain physical or emotional pain and i i don't abandon ship you know i keep pushing because and I, I understand that that's how the process is supposed to work so i guess to some extent it's something that i've been able to develop uh, uh or experience myself over time and then more recently i don't know if you if you actually read the book uh called um Atomic Habits. It's a very famous yeah. book. You probably yeah, yeah, about yeah. it, uh, which I think kind of uh, um, builds on on this idea that that you know the little things uh, uh, you know compounded over time is what what makes the real difference. And so I, I do believe, and I've seen that uh, multiple times in my life that doing little things every day is more important than doing uh, 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 the same thing uh, uh, you know once in a while and 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 ten or a hundred times. Uh, more than if you would have just done it, uh, um, you know, every yeah. day. So again, the 10, 10 push up a day is better than a hundred push ups probably in a couple of weeks uh, or within a couple of weeks. Yeah. So yeah, I, I and, feel, and, I feel strongly about that idea. Yeah. And, and skipping a week and saying, Oh, I'm going to catch up next week and I'll do 200. But um, it's almost like my, you, you said, uh, and, and I apologize to whoever loves this stuff, but I absolutely detest and hate and i can't stand these these dumbass terminologies that somebody came up with which call superpowers and zone of genius yeah. Yeah. i don't believe that anybody has superpowers of anything and i don't believe that anyone is a genius uh even the word expert gets me all riled up um i mean my definition of an expert is what i heard 40 years ago uh, from somebody that that I was I was interning with, and he said, "You know what an expert?" And I said, "No." He said, "Anyone who's fifty miles away from home, right?" Uh. So, um, but yeah, I I think what what you're pointing out in in the quote I just read, I'm not surprised because we've done similar things, although you've done the crazy things of going from Spain to China where you don't speak the language and com everything is completely. You said, like going back to being a baby. Um, I've left Israel and came to the U.S., but the point is, uh, in my case, I'm an only child. So I left the cocoon of being a spoiled guy who can, my parents worked very hard, small grocery saved, and everything was for me, but I wanted to break away and go to a different culture to prove to myself that I don't need to be spoiled. I can do things on my own. Um, you've done it. And I think people that leave everything behind and and make the kind of moves that you've made twice, you know, China and then Japan, um, we understand what it takes to, it's like the concept that I, and I don't know if you've, if you've heard it, and I I should look this up because of this this English general that was going to, to battle and they were going to take over an island somewhere. And when they boats, the boats docked at the island, as, as soon as the soldiers left the boats, the first thing the general did, he burned the boats, uh, right? And so there was no going back. It was mm. just go out and succeed. The concept of burning the boats is when you when you leave your home country and you go to completely something new place and, you compl and you're on your own, right? You start from scratch. Yeah, there's there's uh, no plan B. It's, it's, it's somewhat like entrepreneurship. When I left the corporate a successful corporate job to to become an entrepreneur in the initial six seven eight months when things were really really tough you know you always say to yourself well i can always go back and get a job and i used to get angry at myself for even thinking that way because to me that was the it was the coward way of thinking about stuff no i i made that job and i'm going to keep trying until it works which is what what you deal with with startups right i mean it's for some of them, the risk takers, they put everything on the line. Yes, and 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 one thing um, you kind of mentioned that in passing there, I think is very important. And I've always, uh, um, you know, people ask me, you know, uh, how wh when did you under when did you understand you're a, a, an entrepreneur? 
And again, it's a very basic, even perhaps stupid example. But I remember when I was a kid, I would see, let's say I'm walking with my parents in a supermarket and my parents meet friends, right? That they haven't seen for years. And always one of them says, hey, we should, we should find some time for a coffee. And that time for a coffee never happens. <laughs> and that always made me feel like, you know, why do people say they want to eat for a coffee and then nobody's actually doing anything? And so one of the things I've always tried to do is whenever I tell someone, yeah, we should meet for this, we should meet for that, I always did that. I felt I always did it. And so I feel before you actually become an entrepreneur as, as, as a business entrepreneur, you become an entrepreneur of, your, of, of, of yourself. You know, you're the product, right? Mm -hmm. You are, as you said, you are the guy who says, okay, I want to do this with my life. And you go, there's no plan B. You just keep pushing. It's not always going to work out, but you don't, you know, even if you fail, you stand up and you, 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 you continue and you continue pushing. So I think for anybody listening to us who wants to be an entrepreneur, I think the best way to become an entrepreneur or to be an entrepreneur is become an entrepreneur, right? Is to, is to yeah. be an entrepreneur of yourself. So, so I, I've always felt very strong, strongly about that. So, so in, in studying you and doing some background before, before we meet, I kind of extracted things that, that resonated with me. Uh, and I'm going to use a curse word. So if anybody listening to this with children in the room, you may want to send them away. I don't know. Uh, and so that's a quote from you, Hui. Profit is fuck you money. People are chasing valuations instead of focusing on the oxygen that keeps your business alive. And um, I, you, you, you might say this is so basic that anyone that goes into business should understand that it's not top line revenue. It doesn't make a difference. It's really the profit. That's the lifeblood. That's the oxygen for your business, right? I learned it the hard way by working in the corporate world and particularly in the manufacturing uh, world in medical devices where you make something and you sell it. And if you don't make a profit, then you are a business, right? I mean, you actually have to buy materials and, and buy machines and, and I don't know if you work mostly with with entrepreneurs who are in the SaaS world, you know, the software as a service or tech yeah, guys. I do a lot of B2B. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and you know, the, the problem from my standpoint is that um, the, the issue with SaaS in general, and I could talk for an hour about this. So I have my pet peeve with SaaS people, but uh, they fall in love with their tech. They think the tech will sell itself. Right, they fall in love with their idea. Oh, I have this great platform. Everybody needs it. And when I work with them, and I say, just stop, shut the hell up. Your tech doesn't mean anything. Okay, everybody has tech, right? Uber came up, and three months later, Lyft showed up, and then other the tech doesn't mean anything. But you truly are you truly connecting with your audience? Do you understand the core problem that you're solving in a different way that someone else isn't? But at the end of the day, it's about, are you making money? And, and it's, that's what allows you to move forward, right? And even with SaaS, right. with subscription, you could say, okay, I invested in the coding and now I have a platform. So it, it doesn't cost me anything except to run it. Um, I'm working with a company today, should go and mention where, they're kicking major ass. They got 25% growth every month. Guess what? The 25% churn every month, right? So I said to them, yep. great. So you're sitting in a car in a traffic light. You're pressing the gas pedal all the way down, making a lot of noise. And you're pressing the, the brake pedal at the same time, right? So let's go back to you because that was you. Profit is fuck you money. Talk about that for a second. No, I mean, I mean, I think, I think, uh, and and on, uh, um, I had another uh, uh, post on LinkedIn the other day as well about that. And you know, I, 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 I'm actually reading it now. I have it here in front of me, and I, I wrote something like, "We used to build companies. Now we just stick our hands in another guy's pocket." Hmm. A company used to be an organization selling goods or services to make a profit. Those days are long gone. Today, founders are mostly after media hype. Investors hoping for a future global monopoly. I'm sure it's not you. But if it is, remember, always keep yourself in check, build a company, not the multi-million dollar pothole, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is exactly that. I mean, there's, and, and we as people who deal with a lot of startups, everybody's is more interested in the vanity metrics, right? I have, you know, I raised this number of billions from Andreessen Horowitz, and I'm tackling this huge uh, addressable market. And uh, I 
hiring the best engineers in Silicon Valley. But at the end of the day, we forget that what a business really is, is you making a product or service, selling it and making profit out of it, right? At the end of the day, that's what you're trying to achieve. And I feel more and more what you know startups are is exactly the opposite of that, right? It's As you said, it's all about the growth, mm-hmm. but it's a growth, it's a brainless growth, it's a growth that does not necessarily lead to anything, right? And so this whole this idea of, you know, VC money and Silicon Valley, to be honest with you, I think, you know, when when it uh, when it first uh, was created, maybe what, back in the 80s, I guess, 80s, 90s, it was a great idea. But um, right now, my feeling is, you know, you invest in a company hoping that someone else uh, uh, one day, uh, um, basically, what's 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 the, 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 the way to say this? Ba- basically, uh, uh, someone uh, um, buys you out, right? Yeah, yeah. Because exactly. be, because the business is not sustainable. Because if the business is sustainable, you want to get the dividends. But if the business is not sustainable, you might as well just you know get rid of it as quickly as possible, assuming that somebody else is going to pay a price higher than the price you paid for mm-hmm. the same amount of shares. So that, that's a little bit the idea. And, and then the post continues with, and the reason I wrote this because I was actually reading something about Basecamp. I'm sure you you know yeah. Basecamp because uh, uh, Basecamp has always been uh, uh, about you know the bottom line. How do I make sure that whatever I do, I have enough money in the bank account at the end of the year, I can pay my people uh, yeah. uh, um, um, competitively. You now I can get my people happy. It's not about pleasing investors or the stock market. It's about making sure that you know I'm doing what needs to get done. And that's really why I I, I, I said what I said. And I do believe that is as true today as it was maybe five ten years ago. And most likely, just looking at the way things are going, I think is is still going to be relevant. You know, over the next uh, probably couple of decades. And, and you know, when I was teaching entrepreneurship in graduate school, and when whenever I had an opportunity to speak about it. I always tell people, if your reason to to go into business is because you want to be rich, don't do it. You're going to fail miserably. This can't be the reason why you start a company. It's not because you want to be rich. You're doing it because you you, you can make a difference in somebody's life. Or if it's B2B, it could be a company. It doesn't matter. But behind companies, behind ideas, there's always a human being somewhere. So if you can make a difference in someone's life, and it's and it's and it's tangible difference, right? It is a difference maker. Then, yeah, then pour everything you got into it and go make it a success. And the problem with SaaS companies is, again, I'm not generalizing, but you know better than I do that so many of them want to build the company up to a certain level with a subscription base on the you know monthly retain, re- recurring or annual returning so that they can be v- the valuation could be at a point where someone's going to invest and they can exit and go play again so right, right. so hoy i'm way older than you are so i guess my question to you is in do you think this is generational is it is it your generational that the the digital natives that are growing up don't really understand hard work don't understand grit don't understand that things don't just happen and they just want things to just press press the enter key on a phone or a keyboard and magically life is good is it do you think it's generational i i think i think there's something to it and 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 because i mean think about this right i mean uh, um i'm i was born in 1980 so i remember you know when a friend of, you know let's say a friend of mine wanted to get a hold of me he would call my 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 uh, landline right my my yeah. fixed phone uh, line and if i was not home he would basically speak to my mom i say oh i want to speak to who you know uh, uh, can i leave a message right that's so everything took a lot of time to accomplish now fast forward 25 years or 30 years what's happening is you want a meal uber eats you want a date you go on tinder you want a movie you go on netflix so everything is basically you push a button and you get it so everything is very immediate so i think people don't or or the new generations don't necessarily understand the thing that we do understand which is for us 20 30 years ago to get something done we had to overcome a lot of hurdles right one thing that i know if you if you've watched this and and i recommend anybody who's interested in this topic to watch there's a really good TED Talk with um, Tony Nadal, Nad- uh, Rafael Nadal's uncle, right? He was his uh, coach for many years. And he has an absolutely brilliant TED Talk talking about this. He said, listen, he starts to talk basically saying, have you realized that, and this was maybe 2017 or 18, so it's not necessarily applicable because, of course, older players retire. 
But his insight was if you list down the top 10 ATP ranked players, see how many of those top 10 are over 30 years old. And you'll realize the vast majority of them were over 30 years old. And his point was the reason why this happens is not by coincidence. The reason why this happens is because the older players understand there's no such thing as overnight success. There's no such thing as pushing a button, getting things done. There is this idea of grit, right? You need to suffer. You need to keep pushing through. That's just the way, you know, warriors are made. And so unless the younger generation understands that there's no shortcut to achieve this, the top 10 uh, ranked ATP players are still going to be older players. And you see, I mean, number one now, Djokovic, right? Nadal, I don't know, is number two or number four. Yeah, now you start having uh, uh, younger ones because, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, Federer retired and other guys, Nabal Dian and all the other guys were there back then, all retired. So it's just, you know, uh, uh, you know, nature takes care, of it, takes care of this stuff. But it's a really, I think, interesting uh, and timeless talk on why new generations and old generations see success in a very different way. The other thing that I feel is very interesting, and I always blame... Uh, Paris Hilton for this is the idea of the influencer, right? Yeah. Everybody now wants to be an influencer, right? You push some content on, uh, on TikTok or you do some crazy dances and you have a million to million, three million followers. You make money out of it and you believe that life is always this simple. So anyways, uh, uh, let's not get into the Paris Hilton, mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian stories, but uh, yeah. I think those yeah. things are interconnected. Yeah, I, I don't think they're worth the the, the time and efforts. This is where... We're way over the hour, but but you're right. I coined a term, I think I did, maybe I stole it, lazypreneurs, right? The generation of entrepreneurs who are lazy, who don't don't really subscribe to what you just said, right? And 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 by the way, so you've got the you know the tennis players, and they know that when they get to when they win one tournament, the Australian Open and the French Open, uh, to keep their legacy, they gotta go to the US Open. Uh, a Wimbledon, but even if they get number one, next year there's going to be another one who's going to throw them out. So you have to stay on your toes. You have to continuously practice. Like I think Federal used to go to Dubai and and do all his training there in the heat just to build resistance. You know, yeah. uh, uh, his his fitness levels. Uh, it's a lot of work, just like entrepreneurship. It's a lot of work. Things just don't happen because you have an idea. So, so having said that, because we could probably do this like a two-hour, um, what's the biggest advice you've ever received? So this the is like the, this is not the speed round, Hui. So it's like mm. quick answers. You mean uh, biggest advice in terms of uh, business advice? Anything, something you look back and say, yeah, this is one thing I can point to and say that changed my life. It was a great advice. Could be personal, could be business. Mm. I'm going to be a bit provocative because I have a bit of a passive aggressive uh, relationship with advice as, as mentioned before. And I know that most of the times it's well intention intentioned, but yeah. um, I have, I have a particularly harsh view on, on um, advice from parents. Uh, I think most of the times it, and I, 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 you're a, you're a parent yourself. So, so uh, uh, you, you know, this most of the times it works as peer pressure, right? You buy the house, you get married, you have kids. And, and, and a lot of times again, it's, it's well intentioned. But it, I, I think it kind of completely disregards what the people, what the person actually wants. And so I would say the best advice, and again, I'm being provocative, the best advice was from my mom in 2007 when she told me that I should not move to China. And I did exactly the opposite. And I feel it was the most important thing I've ever done. So uh, thanks, mom. Good for you. My dad wanted me to be an accountant. Uh, and I decided to be a psychologist. That's what I decided to study. So I'm, I'm with you. Um, and with my own kids, uh, I've been very careful. I, I've never, ever told them what they should do. I kind of said, I think I did a good job raising them and they have the mental bandwidth to make decisions on their own. And if they, if it's not the right decision, then they'll have to fix it. But I've been very, very careful. Um, what do you think was your biggest mistake or missed opportunity? My biggest missed opportunity. Um, I think if I 
knew 20 years ago what I know now, I don't think I've been through, I, 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 I would have been through university. I think I would have skipped uh, college. Wow. Uh, and probably I would have, um, I would have, um, you know, uh, left Portugal earlier, uh, traveled more maybe back then. And the reason I'm saying this, I mean, I think, of course, uh, you know, high level education as a place uh, 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 in, you know, uh, yeah, definitely had a place in my life. I just feel like it's way too much time for the stuff that you actually still use. And again, I study business management. Right. And bear in mind that people and I don't, I don't know if it's I, I guess it's the same thing. Definitely. I'm assuming in Israel and maybe in the US as well, which is, you know, because let's say people study law, they become lawyers. A lot of people who study business become accountants. They work at banks. They go work at investment banks. Right. They're not actually business. They don't run businesses. And so I feel as someone who runs my own business, run multiple businesses before, <laughs> I feel like a lot of the stuff that I've learned over four years and a half I don't, 95% of it I don't use. So the point is, if I could have squeezed all the important stuff into six or 12 months, I could have basically, you know, mm -hmm. uh, spend the, the following three or three years and a half doing something probably more uh, uh, valuable with my time. Yeah, and and it's an interesting point because particularly in the US, um, college is incredibly expensive. So we've, we have within each state, there's state schools who are, the cheap version of college. And some of the schools are really good. I'm in New York. Some of the state schools are phenomenally uh, great academic institution, but you figure, uh, you know, between room and board and everything else, probably 20 to $25,000 a year to go to college. And it's four years in America, not three, like in yep. Europe. So it's a hundred thousand dollars. And if you don't have the money, you take a student loan. And the, the, I don't remember the number, but the, the number of people in the U S that have the burden of student loan, uh, when they leave, when they finish college, you pay it for the next 30 years and it doesn't go away. There's yeah. no, you can't get out of it with bankruptcy. You only get out of it as if you die. Student loans are yours forever. And then you go to graduate school and the cost of graduate school for two years, depending on what school you go. If you go to OK school, it could be $30,000, $35,000 a year. If you go to Ivy League school, forget about it. And there are no government funded student loans for graduate school. So I don't know how you finance it. You, you do it, right? But you're right. I think looking back, I've got a degree in undergrad in psychology and MBA in marketing. When I look back and I said, that did not make me smarter person <clears throat> in one sense or another. It was just a piece of paper as a ticket to be a right. candidate for employment some, at some point. And, and for a lot of companies, if you don't have the MBA, you may not be considered for management. But right. but the, the sad reality is you don't need an MBA to be a great leader. You can take courses and you can, I mean, you can actually groom someone from day one without any academic intervention to be a great leader. We know what the skill set is for people who are great leaders. And it doesn't mean you go to school for that, right? Mm -hmm. I was teaching... Absolutely leadership marketing and entrepreneurship in graduate school and I threw out textbooks after a few years I stopped using them because there are the worst possible way to teach anyone anything in in college is to give them a textbook and have them read a definition of what this is like two pages of blah 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 that confuse the heck out of you so uh and you know I, I, uh, sorry, Zev, to, to cut you off, but one, one, I think one, one more interesting idea maybe to share with the audience. Um, there, there is this idea that um, you are is it, you are the, the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? Something like along, yeah, along yeah, those yeah. lines. Yep. And I've, I've, I've found a way to hack this because not everybody has access to five amazing people. The hack for this is to spend a lot of time on YouTube. You find five incredible people on YouTube. You consume as much content from these people as you can. And that's your MBA right there, right? You yeah. get access to the best teachers on any topic for free just by browsing on YouTube. 100%. So and and by the way, I mean, I'm from, from a marketing perspective, I've followed Seth Godin for the past 25 years. He's an incredible person from a market. But I've discovered two people in the last five years that... I, I just, anywhere I go, they're always in my ears. And that's uh, Rory Sutherland. Yeah, amazing. 
you know, advertising an guy. absolutely genius. I, I shouldn't use the word genius. Okay. The guy's brilliant and he's a great, I mean, great communicator. Me, yeah. Yeah. And this is why I got, into, stories. I got into marketing because of Rory, but I didn't know him at the time. It's the, the, the psychology of behavior, behavioral yeah. economics. Yeah. It's brilliant. This is, this is what it's about. And then on the other side, uh, from the coaching side, there's someone called Rich Litvin, who is a coach for high performance, high performing people. Um, an amazing guy, ex Brit that lives in LA now, but, but his, approach and demeanor uh to to identifying to getting clarity by the way because that's that's your focus right to get into clarity on a one-to-one -one level uh is brilliant and, and he's got great content so you're right how, how you're, do you spell that if you don't mind me asking Rich I'll take a look at l-i-t as in tom v-i-n rich okay. litvin okay yeah. i'm gonna um, I'm look him up really uh I mean, I I always like them because his demeanor, he's calm, but his way to cut through to clarity by asking smart questions uh, is is really amazing. So you're right. Um, yeah, skip college, spend your time, follow people on YouTube who have openly shared their knowledge. Uh, you can just start with just TED Talks. Some of the TED Talks are absolutely brilliant, right? The Simon Sinek Why, which he made him a millionaire. Um, there's something there's something there but there's so much good yeah. stuff beyond yeah. that um so last question hui we'll do the the dan sullivan question we fast forward to 2025 okay Where, where's hui where are you what are you doing I, I think i'm still here uh still doing the same thing probably um Japan is definitely, I feel, no, Japan is always going to be uh, a big part of my life. Ideally, and of course, this the, I, I need the uh, financial security first to be able to do this. My idea would be to basically spend six months here and spend six months traveling because I've done that when I had my startups before. And that's kind of the level of freedom and excitement that I, that I want to have. So probably half-half. In terms of uh, professionally speaking, definitely, you know, mentoring full-time. Um, I might venture into e-learning, maybe recording some courses, uh, having more of the webinar seminar thing instead of the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so as always, I like experimenting and, 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 uh, um, uh, trying new things. So probably that's, I would say until 2025, those are probably the two, three things that I want to, that I want to explore. And as, as always, and I don't know if that's something that you agree with or not, um, you know, I think um, it's not wise to make very long-term plans. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I try to, when people say, oh, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? I mean, I have no freaking idea if I'm even going to be here in 10 years. So I prefer to think, you know, in three, six, 12 yeah. month in increments. So 2025 is probably the longest uh, that I'm, yeah, and I'm that's why willing to go right now. Yeah, that's why, you notice I only went two years out because I'm with you. I mean, I, I, when I was growing up in the business world, it was, oh, what's your five, 10 year plan? And today, and I said, you don't even, yeah, you're, we don't even know what's going to happen five years out, you know, in, in where we are, you want to do 18 months, 24 months, three years. Yeah, that's, that's okay. It's reasonable, but chances are something's going to happen. That's going to derail yeah, your yeah, plans absolutely. anyway. I mean, and, listen, six months ago, you would have asked the Google founders and CEO what their plan for the next 12 months would be. And you ask them now, six months later. And I mean, they had no freaking clue six months ago that Microsoft was going to be, you know, breathing down their neck. So uh, yeah, you know, that's why I think, uh, you know, life just uh, happens too fast. Uh, and and you, you make it a disservice by trying to, uh, to plan way too, so too much in advance. There's a, there's a, uh, a UK advertising uh, agency called Wilden and Kennedy, who are at least I think they're American, American WK, right? They're yeah, Nike, Apple but guys. The, but, but the UK, the UK, okay, people, the UK branch uh, has been very successful. And the reason I mention is because, and that video was taken down by it was a Vimeo video. But uh, one of the found so when you walk into their office, and I use this all the time in my talks, mm -hmm. in my writing. When you walk into their office, there is a mannequin dressed up in a suit. Instead of a head, it's a blender. 
And the mannequin is holding a briefcase and on the briefcase it says, walk in stupid every morning. <laughs> and the first time, and there was a video of him explaining it uh, and, it's, and it's gone. But to me, this is an absolutely brilliant concept that your, your tribe of founders should look at this every day and anybody who is in business should look at it every single day. So the concept of walking stupid every morning from a very successful ad agency worldwide was, doesn't matter, we have an, an immense creative talent here. We're very successful. We have some of the biggest brands in the world, but somewhere in the universe that somebody who is smarter than us, who can come up with a better campaign. And so we always have to be conscious. It's sort of having the humility to recognize, yeah, you walk in stupid every morning, meaning it's like, like what you said, right? Chat GPT, chat GPT shows up, everybody jumps all over it, and Google freaks out. So they release their own version. And I think it bombed. It actually, the, the results were Backfired, pretty embarrassing, yeah. right? Yeah. So who knows what's going to happen next? You just don't know. You don't have to, you don't have to freak out about the future, but the thing you should focus on, and I think that's what your teaching is about, is look what's in front of you. And remember that at the end of the day, it's all about profit, right? Because if you don't make money, you don't get to go, you don't wake up tomorrow and continue. Yeah. Yeah. It's always yeah. a lifelong struggle. And the concept of profit to kind of end the circle of what we talked about, um, that's what people miss so often, right? It's not about your top line sales. Who cares? Uh, it's uh, how much money do you have left over at the end of the day, the end of the month to either build equity for yourself if you're a founder or to reinvest and grow and and support your team and hire more talent and do what you have to do. If you don't have that, borrowing it is, is, a, is a financial solution, but you have to go back and ask the question, why am I in a position where I'm not profitable, right? What's the root cause to the Correct. issue? The solutions are always there, but Correct. why is it? And when you go there, which is, my business when when I when my business coaching is to dig deep and find what is the root cause of why the company is stuck, right? And you quickly find out, at least from my experience, it's all about efficiencies and process. There is there is no as as what you call the mental models. Uh, it's not there. People just get sucked into day to day. Like, well, there's problem. We'll fix them. Um, anyway, we can. We can keep going, but um, yeah, you can keep going. I have time if you want to keep going. If you have more um, questions, but look, my let's, my let's, podcast let's is typically my podcast is typically an hour, and sometimes when when I have a lot of fun, like with you, where we go to an hour and twenty, uh, I know that most people are not going to listen or commit to even an hour podcast. Seems to sell out people. That's a long time, uh, which is okay. You know what? Um, someone just someone just somebody that I was on my podcast, Chris Joyce, who is an amazing guy, just sent me something the other day. Uh, and I just got it yesterday. I don't know if you can read it, but it's like a golden because. coin. And it says, uh, I am enough. And on the other side, it says, never give up. Okay. So yep. uh, I would add to I am enough is I'm also, which my friend Zenab uh it also says i'm not for everyone so if you don't want to commit to an hour of, of listening to a podcast and you think it's too much okay then don't listen to it um i can't do podcasting for less than an hour because i, I don't want to rush just that it's popular and it's only 30 minutes and more people listen to it that's not the point of the podcast it's, well, and, 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 and i mean what's what's really is that what's, what's really interesting there as well is i mean if you look at two of the most successful podcasts right? Uh, that's what Joe Rogan and Lex Friedman, these mm -hmm. are three, four hour podcasts. Now, I'll be honest with you, I listen to, you know, dozens of podcasts per month or podcast podcast episodes per month. I very seldom watch it from second one to last second. So what I do is I, they normally have the timestamps and I basically go through the, the, the sections or the areas that I know I, I want to, I want to hear about. So even if there's nobody actually listening to the whole podcast, I'm sure there's going to be certain sections that some people want to hear and other sections other people want to hear. So, you know, it's all good. 
So I, I, I will profess that I don't transcribe the podcast and I don't do those timestamps. And, and the okay. reason why I don't do it, because I don't want people to skip. I, w- I want you to commit. Okay. You, know, okay. listen to, you can fast Fair forward. Enough. You, can, Fair enough. you can hit the 30 seconds advance if you want. Um, but to me, look, I, I spend the time, like at least an average of two hours to, to study the background of my guests so I can ask him good questions. Most of the time, the questions are intuitive based on what we talk about. It's not a, a whole list. Um, you don't want to listen. That's okay. You know, it, it's fine. It's not for everyone. Uh, there's there's one podcast I would mention to you. It's called the Knowledge Project. Uh, for, his Knowledge first name Project. is is Shane. His podcasts are now in twenty minutes, and he has some amazing guests, which I don't think I'll no, ever be. Able I think to I've get. seen it before. The Knowledge yeah. Project. Knowledge Project, and the other one that's great is called the Nudge which is more like a Rory. Rory has his own thing called ALF. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, but the Knowledge Project is an hour and 20 minutes of of phenomenal guy uh, uh, that it digs in with with really impressive, impressive guests, people that I would give my right arm to actually be able to talk to, but he's got it. And there's so much knowledge in his podcasting. That's just, and so my issue is I always listen to it either in the car or if I'm working out, or if I'm going for a long walk, and I know there's some there's some apps that allow you to capture certain timestamps, even when you listen to it. Yeah, you know, I think you can do it automat- automatically these days. I think yeah, it just uh, runs in the background. I haven't found the right one, and and so I'll wind up with one thing I remember, and I just memorize the timestamp, and I say, okay, I got to go uh, back at 12 minutes and 32 seconds because that was something that completely blew me away, and I want to go back. Um, so yeah hoy this was awesome um my pleasure thanks for thank inviting you so me so much uh i i will have your contact info in the in the show notes and then uh we'll circle back and catch up and talk about let's keep in touch absolutely there's a lot of stuff left so hopefully we'll do a, a second uh second round soon Ab- absolutely and, uh, in the meantime if there's anything i can help you with you know where to find me I I do. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you all.